said, okay, so his spirit, that's what he said, is going to the Kaaba and the Buha. Okay? This is my body, this is my blood. Because he is his spirit, life-giving spirit, who gave Adam Adam life. Okay? So the bread becomes his body and wine becomes his blood. Thus together with the Holy Spirit does he express his mission which brings the history of Israel to fulfillment. Thus, together with the Holy Spirit, does Jesus express his own willingness to pour out his life for the sake of the many. The life he gives out is a life-giving spring. Okay? Get his spirit. What this sacrifice shows what this sacrifice shows that is the power and action of the Holy Spirit, the same will be demonstrated in the events that begin to unfold at the end of this very last supper. Jesus arrested, his passion, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the Pentecost of the Holy Spirit. All of this the Holy Spirit shapes into the events that are the perfectly articulated word of the Father to sinful humanity, the life-giving word of the Father. Okay? Now we go to the institution narratives. The institution narratives, again, the importance of understanding that liturgy is a revelation it is a gift, it's not concocted. Pope Benedict explains uh, those realities so well in his book, this book, The Spirit of the Leadership. It's a wonderful book. So that's why I call him the theologian. Because he understands the faith. He explains it crystal clear. Okay, so, remember the story of um, Moses and Pharaoh in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Moses comes to Pharaoh and tells him, God said, let my people go. Usually that's all we hear. Pharaoh said, or Moses said, let my people go. But what does the text say? Where are the people going? Let my people go. Okay. And do what? And go and have fun. Worship. <laughs> because you, as I said before, we, we are used to these half sentences. Okay? Let my people go is half a sentence. God so loved the world and he sent his son. That's half a sentence. It's not the whole sentence, not the whole text. So let my people go. What is the purpose of their going? Worship. To worship in the desert. And this worship, Moses is, this is God reveals to Moses how Moses is to worship or to show people how to worship. So Pharaoh tells Moses, okay, go to worship your God, but you have a desert here in Egypt. So go out in the wilderness, the Egyptian desert. Moses says, no. Those are not the instructions of God. Then Pharaoh says, okay, okay, only now the men go. Moses says, no. Okay, men and women, leave the animals back. Moses says, no, leave the animals behind. Moses says, no. The reason Moses says, no, is this. Because God has told us to go and offer him worship. And we don't know with which we must worship him. I don't know with which I must worship. So, what if I leave something in Egypt where I'm not coming back, okay? I leave something in Egypt, and then I arrive in the desert, and God tells me, okay, worship him with this. And I say, oh, well, I left him in Egypt. <laughs> what did I instruct you to do? To take with you everything. So, there's no compromise on liturgical instruction. Because we don't know with which we must worship God. So these institutional narratives are very, very important in understanding 
that liturgy is revealed, we don't make it up. And that's why a priest should study the liturgies of the church very well, especially the liturgy of the sacrifice, because that's the essence of the priestly ministry, and they do what the church tells us to do. Father, excuse me, how does that statement apply to our life? Or is it just applied to another religion? Liturgy is life. Because liturgy is the living expression of what we believe. Remember, we confess to God. Mm -hmm. And so the purpose of confessing God is to tell Him we know and we believe. And the purpose of our believing is to unite ourselves to God, to the humanity of Jesus Christ, so that we may become partakers of His divinity. For what purpose? To glorify God with our lives. Hence, there is no distinction, or there should not be any distinction between faith, what we confess, and this is faith in action. So we can't say that my faith has no bearing on my life. Okay? Then there is no faith. Because this is the faith I believe, and this is, so this is the knowledge, okay, of the faith. And this is the expression of that glory. So morals is to glorify God with my life. But how do I know? By the truth on which I feel. In order to radiate the, the glory of God. So those two are never, they are inseparable. You cannot, if you separate faith and morals, then there is no faith and there is no morals. It's that simple. So the institution narrative. This institution narrative is basically there are four. One is in Matthew, the other one in Mark, the other one in Luke, and the other one in John. No. <laughs> First Corinthians. There is no institution narrative in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> but if I'm strictly like the institution narrative. But there is that discourse, John chapter 6, okay, where we get this really full understanding of what the institution narrative is about, what it accomplishes. So before we look at the works of institution, we need first to look at the theology of expiation which is being doubted by some who call themselves scholars. I love scholars. <laughs> scholars of the law. Scholars of scripture. Yeah. To the extent of teaching that the works of institution do not date to the time of Jesus himself. You know, human pride most of the time takes up shape in what we call it takes many forms. Yeah? But you know, usually it expresses itself in intellectual pride. Okay? Very intelligent. And so, you have these people who study the faith. Some are priests, some are lay people. But you know, they come flaunting their papers. I have a doctorate in the liturgy. I have a doctorate in Christology. I have a doctorate in scripture. Okay? May I always call those red flags. Not that doctors are bad, but once someone starts, you know, the first thing they tell you, I have a degree in this, I have whatever, then know that all oh, there's trouble here. <laughs> Indeed, there's trouble. <laughs> because we know the first one to flaunt his uh, degree in scripture. Who is he? The devil. <laughs> <laughs> Who is he? <laughs> Who is he? What is his name? Mm -hmm. Me, myself, and I. The accused. 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 The Jesus returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for forty days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was 
hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this, this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then he took him in the devil, took him up, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a single instant. The devil said to him, I shall give you all this power. 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 Humans love power. And you must know that that love, disordered love for power, is a consequence of original sin. <coughs> it's a disorder, that love for power. And it, oftentimes it ruins us. Okay? Want to crave and be near to the powerful. Okay? They tell us to do bad things or whatever. And we do it because we want power. And in the end, we lose everything. Okay? So, for it has been handed over to me. And I may give it to whomever I wish. All this will be yours if you worship me. Jesus said to him in reply, It is written, You shall not wash, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. Then he led him to Jerusalem, made him stand on the parapet of the temple, and I said to him, Okay, listen to the biblical scholar. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And with their hands, they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The devil is quoting scripture, the Psalms. So, not every person who comes to you and talks about the scriptures and God is of God. So that's why we go, oh, but they, 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 she talked about God. He talked about God. Which kind of God are we talking about? Even the devil talks about God. Probably nobody talks about God more than the devil. Because he wants to present himself as God. So he talks about God. But not the real God. Okay? So these are people who claim to be scholars. They have knowledge of the scriptures. But they are satanic. They are liars. That heresy is called modernism and Pope Pius the whatever. But they don't know the name. <laughs> because there are many Piuses. I think this was Pius the Sixth, okay? Sometimes it gets confusing. There are many Piuses, okay? But one of the Pope Piuses, okay, condemned this heresy at the beginning of the 19, uh, 1900s, okay, 19 something. He calls it the mother of all heresies. Because, because it combines all the heresies okay, and it brings everything close to the climax. It's a very dangerous heresy. Okay. So, our treatment of this subject is best okay, on the Pope's book, Jesus of Nazareth, Holy Week to the Resurrection. Okay, this one. Okay. So what we are going to start again. Okay. So, but before we do that, we have to look at how these false teachers, in summary, okay, how they present their arguments. So, this is how these false teachers argue against the historic, historical authenticity of, uh, of the words and actions of the Last Supper. Just to think about this. If there is any doubt about the authenticity of the words of institution, that these words were not said by Jesus, there is no faith. You see that? There is nothing else to believe in about the Christian faith. If the words of the institution didn't come from the mouth of Jesus, if Jesus didn't do what we say he told us to do, there is no Christian faith. Because the Eucharist is the source of the life and activity of the church, and it is the goal, the summit of the life and activity of the church. Just ponder on the, ponder those words. It is the source of the life. Okay? Truth is life. 
and activity of the church. But it's also the goal of the life and activity of the church. So everything we do proceeds from the Eucharist and it returns there. Communion with God. So what accomplishes that is the Eucharist. But if there are no words of institution, there is no Eucharist. At least as Jesus commanded us to do it. So we can improvise and do what we think we, we can do, but if it's not by the command of Jesus Christ within the church, we don't have the source of the life and activity of the church, and we don't have the goal, the summit of the life and activity of the church. So that's why these Satanists again, found a very good way of basically destroying the faith. Once you see, you plant seeds of doubt about the institution narratives, the words of institution, you have done your job as the devil. You have destroyed the faith. People may continue to come to church, to Mass on Sunday, but it's not about worship. It's about what we do. Because we feel good doing about it. I just, I love to go to church on Sunday. Because, you know, after Mass we go out and you know, have dinner as a family or lunch as a family. So I, I just love it. But what is the essence of it? You just go and have a good time. But what is the goal? So if this is something extremely dangerous, there is no doubt that Jesus did what he did at the last supper. There is no doubt. You know? But this, this, this is satanic. Modernism is satanic. Right? Uh, and it, 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 it expresses the worst form of Satanism. Yeah? So, they say, this is the heresy, they say that there is an insoluble contradiction, a contradiction that cannot be resolved, an insoluble contradiction between Jesus' message about the kingdom of God and the notion of his vicarious expiatory death. They will read and explain. So they argue that Jesus taught that the Father is unconditionally ready to pardon. We talk about the unconditional love of God. There is no question about that. Yeah? This was Jesus' image of God, meaning unconditional forgiveness. Okay? That was Jesus' image of God, as if Jesus didn't know God. Okay? So that was Jesus' image of God, they contend, and therefore the idea of him demanding expiation would mean that the God of Jesus Christ was not so magnanimous with his grace and so sovereign after all, since he demanded expiation. So God, if you are all forgiven, if your love is unconditional, why do you ask for sacrifice? You see the argument? Okay. God's unconditional love, according to this heresy, would exclude the passion. Because the passion would be contrary to God is magnanimous, God's gracious will, God's gracious love. So how can unconditional love go hand in hand with sacrifice? How can the passion be integral with and to God's unconditional love? You see how easy these people can mislead others. Because when they argue like that, you say, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if God is so forgiving, why would he demand that his son dies on the cross? Why would he demand that we suffer? His love is unconditional. He just says, I'm forgiven, you are forgiven, you are forgiven. Why go through all these other things? Okay? Just to say, I'm forgiven, go have fun. It's easy. That way. Okay? So, so, you see, it's, it's a, it can be attractive. Lies are very attractive. Okay? Yes. That's why, oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, we end up voting for liars. Because what to hear lies. We don't want when a politician comes out and says the truth, we have to sacrifice there'll be hard times. No thanks. <laughs> okay. No thanks. Okay? When someone who tells us things will be easy. Yeah. 
So, so in this expiation, suffering is not attractive. Okay? So, but here the thing is, God is unconditional. His love is unconditional, so he wouldn't demand expiation. Okay? That's the essence of the argument. Otherwise, God's love wouldn't be so gracious, and his grace wouldn't be so sovereign after all. Because God, if you're all powerful, your grace is sovereign, just to say you're saved. Why do you have to go through the passion and death in order for you to give grace? <coughs> it means that you are not very generous with your grace, but your grace is not all that effective. It needs something to patch it up. Okay? So, according to these people, Jesus, with his proclamation of the kingdom of God, must surely be diametrically opposed to such a notion. Okay? If Jesus is the new messenger of God, should he not be opposed to this notion? So they ask. True messenger of God's love. Yeah? They claim that expiation was a phase in man's religious development that we need to move beyond. Okay? Expiation, okay? sacrifice, was simply an infant stage in human development. Now we need to grow beyond that. So what we do is childish. We should grow up, they tell us. Okay? So this is the reason why a good number of the so-called modern theologians reject the idea that the words of the Last Supper go back to Jesus himself. So you see how they, they, they say something and then they contradict themselves okay, down the line. As all lies do. When we lie, we have to find another lie to cover the lie. So when we begin to lie, we keep on contradicting ourselves. So in modernism, you can see that it's very unsensible because they'll assert a truth because they want to lie about something else. And then the truth they allied, or they, 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 they proposed, is now attacked or contradicted by another lie because they want to produce another lie. They go on like that, on and on and on. Okay? So, listen to their, their argument is, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God, and his idea of God was unconditional love. Okay? So, his message should be, and was opposed to, expiation, sacrifice. Okay? So that's their argument. And then, listen how they proceed. So they base their arguments on the false notion that there is a contradiction between the Galilean proclamation of the kingdom of God and Jesus' final teaching upon arrival in Jerusalem, which contradiction that does not exist. But they argue this way. Yeah? They argue that Jesus only turned to the language of the cross. So, in order to propound their lie before, they say that the message of Jesus didn't include the cross. Okay? Which means that the cross expiation was concocted by the apostles. It doesn't date from Jesus. And then down the line, they contradict themselves that, well, Jesus proclaimed in Galilee the love of God, but when he recognized that people rejected him, then he turned it to the language of the cross. So which is which? Was the cross concocted by the apostles or by Jesus? Jesus. But they said Jesus' message was about unconditional love of God, not expiation. But now down the line they said, well, Jesus turned to this after he was rejected. So which is which? So you see the contradiction there. So they, 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 they're very unsensible. So they argue that Jesus only turned to the language of the cross after he realized that his message of salvation was rejected by the Jews. So they look at Jesus, not as God, but a desperately confused, self-proclaimed teacher seeking some level of influence and therefore ready to change positions as he thinks fit. That's how they look at Jesus. That's how modernism looks at Jesus. So in the end, they will proclaim to you that Jesus is a mere human who thought that he would turn the wheels of history by his death. 
but he hangs upon the cross and the wheels of history continue. So Jesus was a misguided human being, a misguided rabbi. Who are these scholars? It's modernism. They're different. It's in Protestantism and in Catholicism. In Catholicism? Yes. We have them in the church. Heretics who teach this. It sounds like the Mormons. No, no, this is very different from Mormonism. No, yeah, this is just a, it's a, yes, this is, this is very, very, this is very dangerous heresy, okay? Was it Martin Luther a Protestant? Pardon? Martin Luther? Well, you may say that uh, the this, this, seeds are there, yeah. but uh, um, Martin Luther did not say many of the things moderns say, okay? It's a different uh, take. Okay? okay. So, as we continue, this is absolutely not true according to the evidence of scripture itself which presses so many elements of the cross right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We are going to look at a few. As we see in the Sermon on the Mount which was proclaimed in Galilee. Okay? So we see, what, what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? <coughs> Blessed are Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed. So, if his uh, think about idea of God was a romanticized unconditional love, why would he preach like that at the beginning of his ministry? Or in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, why would he say the kingdom of God is at hand? Repent and believe. Why would he call people to repentance? Repentance is a painful process. It involves renouncing the self. Okay? Our vices, which are so easy to, to do, to follow. Okay? But we renounce them. Why, why would he do that? At the beginning of his ministry, he called us to, to embrace the cross. Because repentance is the cross. All of us adults know it. Okay? Sin can be sweet. Okay? And we have our sinful behaviors, which we don't have, want to, to leave behind. So, but by the grace of God, we renounce those things, but it is a painful process. It's easy, very easy to be bad. It's not easy to be good. <laughs> okay? So, at the very inception of the Gospel, Jesus teaches this. We see in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 220, Jesus already talks about his being taken away, meaning the cross. So all the parables... The whole proclamation of God's kingdom are placed under the sign of the cross. Viewed it through the lens of the Last Supper and the Resurrection, we could describe, and indeed Jesus himself describes the cross as the most radical expression of God's unconditional love, as he offers himself despite all rejection on the part of men taking man's no upon himself and then drawing it into his yes to the Father. So by his obedience, his yes to the Father, our disobedience is destroyed. <clears throat> but that destruction takes place by way of passion, death, and then resurrection. There is no contradiction between Jesus' proclamation of joy and his acceptance acceptance of death on the cross for many. On the contrary, only through this acceptance and the transformation of death does the message of grace acquire its full death. Moreover, the idea that the Eucharist originated within the community, meaning it doesn't come from Jesus, but within the community is quite absurd, even from a historical point of view. Who could possibly have dreamt upon such an idea, such a reality? Could the apostles have concocted this thing? How? They already knew the Jewish Passover. Okay? If it were to continue, if Jesus didn't tell them to do what the new covenant is, they would have kept on doing what Israel did, because they knew it. How could the first generation of Christians as early as the 30s have accepted such an invention without anyone calling it into question 
Remember that St. Paul writing the first letter, the Corinthians, around 56 AD, is, that is where the institution narrative is, okay? is already talking about what he himself received. So by 56 AD, that's like a 20 something years after the death of Jesus, already the celebration of the Eucharist is a tradition handed on. And also, if the apostles had concocted this, there were many disciples, many people, who saw Jesus. Okay? Who saw these events. If Jesus didn't suffer, if he didn't die, if he didn't rise from the dead, which is the importance of authenticating his passion and death, if he just died, all of us can die. There's nothing special about it. But he rose from the dead. That's the Paschal mystery we celebrate. So people who were there would have said to the apostles, you are lying. These things didn't happen. But these people were contemporaries of these things and they saw it. And they didn't contend that it happened. Now people living 1900 years later are the ones telling us that it didn't happen. Well, it's the same denial of the Holocaust. So where do you get it from? Where do you get it from? 1900 years later, you are telling us it didn't happen. The primary witnesses and the many other disciples, even people who didn't believe in Jesus, when he was from Bethlehem, okay, we are told that the gods went to the priests, the Sanhedrin, and told them it happened. It happened. Oh, we will give you money. You don't say, we'll give you money. They know what happened, okay? So that someone can come about 1900 years later and tell us, no, it didn't happen. Because you don't know. Those who know will tell us it happened. So according to the evidence of divine revelation, there is no alternative explanation of the Last Supper tradition because no such explanation exists. Only from the mind of Jesus himself could such a reality have emerged. Only he could authoritatively weave together the strands of the law and the prophets, remaining entirely faithful to scripture while expressing the radically new quality of his sonship. Only because he himself spoke and acted thus could the church in her various manifestations, break bread from the very beginning, as Jesus did on the night he was betrayed. The words of institution are authentically Jesus' own words. The rejection by the critics of the words of institution, of course, is the result of the fact that the idea of expiation is incomprehensible to the so-called modern mind. Okay. So, this uh, you can uh, read more about that heresy. Okay. You can read more about the heresy. And of course, as you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, which is a historical event, because even those who had rejected him okay, talked about it, okay, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, the apostles themselves didn't understand it. So we know the story of the two disciples who were going to Emmaus. Jesus rose near to them. And then they go back to Jerusalem to recount the story. And then Jesus appears to them all while the two disciples were also there. And then he began to explain it to them the mystery of his passion, death, and the resurrection. And basically it tells them that you're slow to believe. So the disciples didn't concoct it because they themselves didn't understand. This reality had to be explained to them after Jesus rose from the dead. So let's end with that text. Okay? Then we are still going with the institution narrative. Next week we'll be looking at the theology of the institution narratives. But here we look at Luke chapter 24.
Let's begin with verse 36. That the apostles couldn't have concocted this because they themselves didn't understand what was happening, what had happened. Okay? They grew in understanding because the reason Christ instructed them. Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 36. The appearance to the disciples in Jerusalem. While they were still speaking about this, about what? About the two disciples, and coming back to explain. Okay? He stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified, and they thought they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and the bones as you can see I have. That's why made, that's what made Peter later on in the book of Acts to say that we ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. We are telling you the truth. Okay? And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. And then what follows? He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses in and in the prophets and the psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds. They couldn't concoct the Eucharist because they didn't understand. Jesus himself had to explain to them more deeply the meaning of this mystery after he rose from the dead. They were there at the Last Supper, at the institution of the New Covenant, but they didn't fully comprehend the mystery. Okay? So, so he opened their mind, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name, to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending you, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The important thing here is this. Thus it is written that the Messiah would suffer. Remember Peter himself told Jesus, when Jesus told him that he's going to suffer, Peter said, no, 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 it can't happen to you. And he told him, get behind his head. So after he was from the dead, now they understand. Because they couldn't comprehend the suffering Messiah. One who comes to redeem Israel to die on a cross. What kind of a savior that is. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask if, uh, if they couldn't understand the scriptures because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Well, they understood some things, <coughs> as Jesus told them, but they couldn't comprehend everything. And so he said, I will, I will send the Spirit to explain to you everything. Okay? But then, Jesus himself, after he rose from the dead, remember, again, his word is Spirit. He continues to teach after he rose from the dead. Okay? And of course, that's what we mean, even in our church, when we have catechumens, after their baptism on Easter night, they continue to come in what we call Mr. Gorgia. So that what they received the saints in. So the apostles received the Paschal mystery at the Last Supper, but they didn't fully comprehend the magnitude of what it was. So Jesus had to come after he rose from the dead to catechize. Okay? Mr. Gorgia. So that it sinks in. And of course, the Holy Spirit will continue to enlighten. Okay. So that's why the church continues to grow in the understanding of the mystery of God until the end of time. Okay. 
Que glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was at the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. Thanks for coming and have a good night. Thank you, Father. Summer day is the Immaculate Conception. Holy day of talking. Solemnity, okay? Yes. 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 Yes.